Management Prerogative, 2015, 2014, 2013, 2010, 03, 02. Q. Which takes precedence in conflicts arising between employer's management prerogative and the employee's right to security of tenure? Why? The employee's right to security of tenure takes precedence over the employer's management prerogative. Thus, an employer's management prerogative includes the right to terminate the services of an employee, but this management prerogative is limited by the labor code, which provides that the employer can terminate an employee only for a just cause or when authorized by law. This limitation on management prerogative is because no less than the Constitution recognizes and guarantees an employee's right to security of tenure. 279 Labor Code Article 8, Section 3, Constitution Q. Harbor View Hotel has an existing collective bargaining agreement, CBA, with a union of frank and file employees consisting, among others, of bartenders, waiters, room boys, housemen, and stewards. During the lifetime of the CBA, Harbor View Hotel, for reasons of economy and efficiency, decided to abolish the position of housemen and stewards who do the cleaning of the hotel's public areas. Over the protests of the union, the hotel contracted out the aforementioned job to the city service janitorial company, a bona fide independent contractor, which has a substantial capital in the form of janitorial tools, equipment, machineries, and competent manpower. Is the action of the Harbor View Hotel legal and valid? The action of Harbor View Hotel is legal and valid. The valid exercise of management prerogative, discretion, and judgment encompasses all aspects of employment, including the hiring, work assignments, working methods, time, place, and manner of work, tools to be used, processes to be followed, supervision of workers, working regulations, transfer of employees, work supervision, layoff of workers, and the discipline, dismissal, and recall of workers, except as provided for or limited by special laws. Company policies and regulations, unless shown to be grossly oppressive or contrary to law, are generally binding and valid on the parties and must be complied with until finally revised or amended unilaterally or preferably through negotiation or by competent authority. San Miguel Corporation versus Reynaldo Ubaldo and Emmanuel Well Cruz. Transfer of Employees 2015. Tindin is a single mother with one child. She is employed as a sales executive at the prominent supermarket. She and her child live in Casa City and her residence and workplace are a 15 minute drive apart. One day, Dindin is informed by her boss that she is being promoted to a managerial position, but she is now being transferred to the Visayas. Dindin does not want to uproot her family and refuses to offer. Her boss is so humiliated by Dindin's refusal of the offer that she gives Dindin successive unsatisfactory evaluations that result in Dindin's being removed from the supermarket. Dindin approaches you as a counsel for legal advice. What would you advise her? I will advise Dindin to sue her boss and the supermarket for illegal dismissal. Dindin cannot be compelled to accept the promotion. Her unsatisfactory evaluations, as well as her boss' insistence that she should agree to the intended transfer to Visayas, are badges of an abuse of management prerogative. In Pfizer versus Velasco, the Supreme Court held that the managerial prerogative to transfer personnel must be exercised without abuse of discretion, bearing in mind the basic elements of justice and fair play. Hence, this, this dismissal is illegal. Bonus The projected bonus for the employees of Suerte Company was 50% of their monthly compensation. Unfortunately, due to the slump in the business, the president reduced the bonus to 5% of their compensation. Can the company unilaterally reduce the amount of bonus? Yes, the granting of a bonus is a management prerogative, something given in addition to what is ordinarily received by or strictly due the recipient. An employer like Suerte Company 
cannot be forced to distribute bonuses when it can no longer afford to pay. To hold otherwise would be to penalize the employer for his past generosity. Producers Bank of the Philippine versus NLRC. Lito was anticipating the bonus he would receive for 2013. Aside from the 13-month pay, the company has been awarding him and his other co-employees a two to three months bonus for the last 10 years. However, because of poor overall sales performance for the year, the company unilaterally decided to pay only one month bonus in 2013. Is Lita's employer legally allowed to reduce the bonus? Yes, a bonus is an act of generosity granted by an enlightened employer to spur the employee to greater efforts for the success of the business and realization of bigger profits. The granting of a bonus is a management prerogative, something given in addition to what is ordinarily received by or strictly due the recipient. Thus, a bonus is not a demandable and enforceable obligation except when it is made part of the wage, salary, or compensation of the employee. It may therefore be withdrawn unless have been made part of the wage or salary or compensation of the employees, a matter which is not in fact of the case. American Wire and Cable Daily Rated Employees Union versus American Wire and Cable April 29, 2005 Far East Bank, FEB, is one of the leading banks in the country. Its compensation and bonus packages are top of the industry. For the last six years, FEB had been providing the following bonuses across the board to all its employees. 13-month pay, 14- to 18-month pay, Christmas basket worth 6000 gift check worth 4000 Productivity-based incentive ranging from 20% to 20% increase in gross monthly salary for all employees who would receive an evaluation of excellence for three straight quarters in the same year. Because of its poor performance overall, FEB decided to cut back on the bonuses this year and limited itself to the following 13-month pay, 14-month pay, Christmas basket of 4000 gift check of worth 2000 Katrina, an employee of FEB, who had gotten a raise of excellent for the last three quarters, was looking forward to the bonuses plus the productivity incentive bonus. After learning that FEB had modified the bonus scheme, she objected. Is Katrina's objection justified? Katrina's objection is justified. Having enjoyed the across-the-board bonuses, Katrina has earned a vested right. Hence, none of them can be withheld or reduced. In the problem, the company has not proven its alleged losses to be substantial. Permitting reduction of pay at the slightest indication of losses is contrary to the policy of the state to afford full protection to labor and promote full employment. Linton Commercial Company v. Hilera As to the withheld productivity-based bonuses, Katrina is deemed to have earned them because of her excellent performance ratings for three quarters. On this basis, they cannot be withheld without violating the principle of non-diminution of benefits. Moreover, it is evident from the facts of the case that what was withdrawn by FEB was the productivity bonus protected by RA 6791, which mandates that the monetary value of the productivity improvement be shared with the employees. The productivity-based incentive scheme of FEB cannot just be withdrawn without the consent of its affected employees. Change of working hours. Q. Intergarments company manufactures garments for export and requires its employees to render overtime, ranging from two to three hours a day, to meet its clients' deadlines. Since 2009, it has been paying its employees an overtime on an additional 35% of their hourly rate for work rendered in excess of their regular eight working hours. Due to the slowdown of its export business in 2012, Intergarments had to reduce its overtime work. At the same time, it adjusted the overtime rates so that those who work overtime were only paid an additional 25% instead of the previous 35%. To replace the workers' overtime rate loss, the company granted a one-time 5% across-the-board wage increase. Vigilant Union, the rank-and-file bargaining agent, charged the company with unfair labor practice 
on the ground that one no consultations had been made on who would render overtime work and two the unilateral overtime pay rate reduction is a violation of article 100 entitled prohibition against elimination of diminution of benefits of the labor code is the union's position meritorious the allegation of ulp by the union is not meritorious the selection as to who would render overtime work is the management prerogative however the charge of the union on the diminution of benefits violation of article 100 of the labor code appears to be meritorious since three years have already elapsed and overtime rate of 35 percent has ripened into practice and policy and cannot anymore be removed Sevilla treading versus semana this is deliberate consistent and practice over a long period of time marriage between employees of competitor employees a was working as a medical representative of rx pharmaceutical company when he met and fell in love with b a marketing strategist for a delta drug company a competitor of rc on several occasions the management of rx called a's attention to the stipulation in his employment contract that requires him to disclose any relationship by consanguinity or affinity with co-employees or employees of competing companies in light of a possible conflict of interest. A seeks your advice on the validity of the company policy. What would be your advice? The company policy is valid. However, it does not apply to A, as A and B are not yet married. No relationship by consanguinity or affinity exists between them. The case of Duncan versus Glaxo Welcome does not apply in the present case. Social Welfare Legislation State the respective coverage of Social Security Law, Revised Government Service Insurance Act, Employees' Compensation Act. Social Security Law Coverage of SSS includes Section 9 and 9-A Social Security Act of 1997. Employees not over 60 years of age and their employers. Domestic helpers provided their monthly income shall not be less than 1,000. Self-employed persons as provided by law and as determined by the commission. Spouse that is fully devoted to management of household and family affairs on voluntary basis. Filipinos recruited by foreign-based employers abroad on voluntary basis. Note, under R8, 10.36.1 Kasam Bahai Law, domestic helpers who have rendered at least one month of service, regardless of the amount of their salary, shall be covered by the SSS. Premium payments or contribution shall be shouldered by the employer. However, if the domestic worker is receiving a wage of 5000 and above per month, the domestic worker shall pay the proportionate share in the premium payments or contributions as provided by law. Revised GSIS. Membership in the Government Service Insurance System, RA 8291, shall be compulsory for all employees receiving compensation who have not reached the compulsory retirement age, irrespective of employment status, except members of the AFP, PNP, and contractual that have no employer employer relationship with the agencies that they serve. Employees included are any person receiving compensation while in the service of employers which includes the national government its political subdivisions branches agencies or instrumentalities including GOCCs and financial institutions with original charters constitutional commissions and judiciary whether by election or appointment irrespective of status of appointment including barangay and sangguniang officials Employees' Compensation Act, coverage in the State Insurance Fund, Article 168, Labor Code, shall be compulsory upon all employers and their employees not over 60 years of age, provided that an employee who is over 60 years of age and paying contributions to qualify for the retirement or life insurance benefit administered by the system shall be subject to compulsory coverage. The employer or employee may either belong to the public or private sector as covered by their own respective system. SSS Law Coverage and Exclusions 2015 7 9 10 04 
state the respective coverage of the Social Security law. Coverage of SSS Section 9 RA 8282 shall be compulsory upon all employees not over 60 years of age and their employers. Filipinos recruited in the Philippines by foreign-based employers for employment abroad may be covered by the SSS on a voluntary basis. Coverage in the SSS shall also be compulsory upon all self-employed persons earning 1800 or more per month. Luisa is an unwed mother with three children from different fathers. In 2004, she became a member of the Social Security system. That same year, she suffered a miscarriage of a baby out of wedlock from the father of her third child. She wants to claim maternity benefits under the SSS Act. Is she entitled? Yes, provided Luisa has reported to her employer her pregnancy and date of expected delivery and paid at least three monthly contributions during the 12-month period immediately preceding her miscarriage, then she is entitled to maternity benefits up to four deliveries. As to the fact that she got pregnant outside wedlock, as in her past three pregnancies, this will not bar her claim because the SSS is non-discriminatory. No, the law really says a female employee it does not qualify the term to mean legally married woman. Section 14-A of the SSS The owners of Falcon Factory, a company engaged in the assembling of automotive components, decided to have their building renovated. Fifty persons composed of engineers, architects, and other construction workers were hired by the company for this purpose. The work was estimated to be completed in three years. The employees contended that since the work would be completed after more than one year, they should be subject to compulsory coverage under the SSS law. Do you agree with their contention? No. Under Section 8, Letter J of RA 1161 as amended, employment of purely casual and not for the purpose of the occupation or business of the employer are accepted from compulsory coverage and employment is purely casual if it is not for the purpose of occupation or business of the employer. In the problem given, Falcon Factory is a company engaged in the assembling of automotive components. The 50 persons, engineers, architects, and construction workers were hired by Falcon Factory to renovate its building. The work to be performed by these 50 people is not in connection with the purpose of the business of the factory. Hence, the employee of these 50 persons is purely casual. They are therefore exempted from the compulsory coverage of the SSS law. I agree with the contention that the employees hired by the owners of Falcon Factory as construction workers in the renovation of its building should be under the compulsory coverage of the securities law. It is true that in connection with Falcon Factory, which is engaged in the assembling of automotive components, the construction workers may be considered casual employees because their employment is not for the purpose of occupation of business of Falcon Factory, as such in accordance with Section 8, Letter J of the Social Security Law, they are accepted from the compulsory coverage of the security, Social Security System but they could also be considered project employees of Falcon Factory and as such could be under the compulsory coverage of the SSS applying Article 4 of the Labor Code that provides that all doubts in the implementation and interpretation of the provisions of labor law shall be resolved in favor of labor. The employees here, therefore, should be considered as under the compulsory coverage of the SSS. Tito Pasanchoso is an employee of a foundry shop in Malabon, Metro Manila. He is barely able to make ends meet with his salary of 4000 a month. One day, he asked his employer to stop deducting from his salary his SSS monthly contribution, reasoning out that he is waiving his Social Security coverage. If you were Tito's employer, would you grant his request? 2008. No. As Tito's employer, I am bound by law to remit to SSS Tito's monthly contribution. The SSS law covers any person natural, juridical, domestic, or foreign, carrying in the Philippines trade, business, industry, undertaking, 
or activity and uses the service of another under his order as regards employment. Section 89, letter C. The compulsory coverage of employers and employees under the SSS law is actually a legal imposition on the employers and employees designed to provide social security to working men. Membership in SSS is in compliance with the lawful exercise of the police power of the state and may not be waived by agreement of any party. Philippine Blooming Mills versus SSS. Can a member of a cooperative be deemed an employee for purposes of compulsory coverage under the Social Security Act? Yes, an employee of a cooperative not over 60 years of age is under the SSS law. Subject to compulsory coverage, the Section 8, Letter D, SSS law defines an employee as any person who performs services for an employer in which either or both mental and physical efforts are used and who receives compensation for such service where there is an employer-employee relationship. Dependents, Beneficiaries Q. A is an employee of B, who in turn registered A with the Social Security System as required by law. Unfortunately, B did not remit A's contribution to the system. In the course of his employment, A met a serious accident requiring his hospitalization. Suppose he decides to retire from the firm because of the accident. Is he entitled to recover retirement benefits under the system? Explain. A is entitled to receive benefits from the Social Security system, even if his employer did not remit A's contribution to the system because the Social Security law provides in Section 22, Letter B, that the failure or refusal of the employer to pay or remit contributions shall not prejudice the right of the covered employee to the benefits of the coverage. But A is not entitled to retirement benefits in the form of a monthly pension unless at the time of the accident he has reached the age of 60 years and has paid at least 120 monthly contributions prior to the semester of the accident. B. Suppose that he died because of the accident. Are his ears entitled to death benefits under the system? The ears are not entitled, but his primary beneficiaries, or in the absence of primary beneficiaries, his secondary beneficiaries are entitled. Miss Sarah Mira is an unwed mother with three children from three different fathers. In 1999, she became a member of the Social Security system. In August 2000, she suffered a miscarriage, also out of wedlock, and again by a different father. Can Miss Mira claim maternity benefits from the Social Security Act? Yes, she can claim maternity benefits entitled men thereto is not dependent on the claimants being legally married. GSIS Odek, a policeman, was on leave for a month. While resting in their house, he heard two of his neighbors fighting with each other. Odek rushed to the scene intending to pacify the protagonist. However, he was shot to death by one of the protagonists. Shop, a housemaid, was Odek's surviving spouse, whom he had abandoned for another woman years back. When she learned of Odek's death, Shop filed a claim with the GSIS for death benefits. However, her claim was denied because A. When Odek was killed, he was in leave, and B. She was not the dependent spouse on Odek's when he died. Resolve with reason whether GSIS is correct in denying the claim. Yes, because under the law, a dependent is one who is a legitimate spouse living with the employee. Article 167, letter I of the Labor Code. In the problem given, Shop had been abandoned by Odek, who was then living already with another woman at the time of his death. Moreover, Odek was on leave when he was killed. The 24-hour duty rule does not apply when the policeman is on vacation leave. Employees' Compensation Commission versus CA. Taking together jurisprudence and the pertinent guidelines on the ECC with respect to claim for that benefits namely. A. That the employee must be at the place where his work requires him to be. B. That the employee must have been performing his official functions and C that the injury is sustained elsewhere, the employee must have been executing an order for the employer. It is not difficult to understand that why Shop's claim was denied by the GSIS, than Singh covers GSIS. In the present case, Odek was resting 
at his house when the incident happened. Thus, he was not at a place where his work requires him to be. Although, at the time of his death, Odek was performing a police function, it cannot be said that his death occurred elsewhere other than the place where he was supposed to be because he was executing an order for his employer. 2005 Bar Q. Louis, a PNP officer, was off duty and resting at home when he heard a scuffle outside his house. He saw two of his neighbors fighting and he rushed out to pacify them. One of the neighbors shot Louis by mistake, which resulted in Louis's death. Marianne, Louis's widow, filed a claim with the GSIS seeking death benefits. The GSIS denied the claim on the ground that the death of Louis was not service related, as he was off duty when the incident happened. Is the GSIS correct? 2015. No, the GSIS is not correct. Louis, a policeman, just like a soldier, is covered by the 24 hour duty rule. He is deemed on round the clock duty unless on official leave, in which case his death outside performance of official peacekeeping mission will bar death claim. In this case, Louis was not on official leave and he died in the performance of a peacekeeping mission. Therefore, his death is compensable. Dependents and Beneficiaries Piroy Mondero was employed as a public school teacher at the Marin Duque High School from July 1, 1983 until his untimely demise on May 27, 1997. On April 27, 1997, a memorandum was issued by the school principal, which reads, You are hereby designated to prepare the model dam project, which will be the official entry of our school in the forthcoming division search for outstanding improvised secondary science equipment for teachers to be held in Manila on June 4, 1997. You are hereby instructed to complete this model dam on or before the scheduled date of the contest. Mondera complied with the superior's instruction and constructed an improvised electric microdam, which he took home to enable him to finish it before the deadline. On May 27, 1997, while working on the model dam project in his house, he came to contact with a live wire and was electrocuted. He was immediately brought to a clinic for emergency treatment but was pronounced dead on arrival. The death certificate showed that he died of cardiac arrest due to accidental electrocution. Pepe Palaypay, Peter's Mondero's common law wife, for more than 20 years, and a Pitoy Mondero Jr., his only son, filed a claim for death benefits with the Government Service Insurance System, GSIS, which was denied on the ground that Piroy Mondero's death did not arise out of and in the course of employment and therefore not compensable because the accident occurred in his house and not in the school premises. Is Pepe Palaypay entitled to file a claim for death benefits with that GSIS? The beneficiaries of a member of GSIS are entitled to the benefits arising from the death of said member. Death benefits are called survivorship benefits under the GSIS law. Pepe Palaypay is not entitled to receive survivorship benefits since she is not a beneficiary being a common law wife and not a legal dependent spouse. Is the cause of death of Pito y Mondero cardiac arrest due to electrocution accidental in his house compensable? Yes, to be compensable under the GSIS law, the death need not be work connected. As long as the dissident member was in service B. Rendered three years of service, at least paid 36 monthly contribution within the five years period immediately preceding his death, or C. Paid a total of at least 180 monthly contributions prior to his death. Benefits Attorney CLLM, a dedicated and efficient public official, was the top executive of a government owned and controlled corporation, GOCC. While inspecting an ongoing project in a remote village in Mindanao, she suffered a stroke and since then had been confined to a wheelchair. At the time she stopped working because of her illness in line of duty, attorney CLM was only 60 years old but she had been an active member of the GSIS for 30 years without any break in her service record. 
What benefits could she claim from the GSIS? Cite at least five. 1. Separation Benefits, Section 11 to 12 of GSIS Act 1997, Retirement Benefits, Section 13 to 14, Permanent Disability Benefits, Section 15 to 17, Temporary Disability Benefits, 18 to 19, Survivorship Benefits, 20 to 22, Funeral Benefits, Section 23, Life Insurance Benefit, Section 24 to 27. Portability Law 2014. How are the portability provisions of Republic Act No. 7699 beneficial or advantageous to SSS and GSIS members in terms of their creditable employment services in the private sector or the government, as the case may be, for purposes of that, disability or retirement? Portability provisions of RA 7699 shall benefit a covered worker who transfers employment from one sector to another or is employed in both sectors, whose creditable services or contributions in both systems credited to his service or contribution record in each of the system and shall be totalized for purposes of old age, disability, survivorship, and other benefits. Section 3, RA 7699. In the event the employees transfer from the private sector to the public sector or vice versa, their creditable employment services and contributions are carried over and transferred as well. Luisito has been working with Lima Land for 20 years. Wanting to work in the public sector, Luisito applied with and was offered a job at Live Corps. Before accepting the offer, he wanted to consult you whether the payments that he and Lima land had made to the social security system can be transferred or credited to the government service insurance system what would you advise yes under ra 7699 otherwise known as the portability law one may combine his years of service in the private sector represented by his contributions to the social security system with his government service and contributions to the gsis the contributions shall be totalized for purposes of old age, disability, survivorship, and other benefits in case the covered member does not qualify for such benefits in either or both systems without totalization. Employees' Compensation, Coverage, and When Compensable Victor was hired by a local manning agency as a seafarer cook on board a luxury vessel for an eight-month cruise. While on board, Victor complained of chronic coughing, intermittent fever, and joint pains. He was advised by the ship's doctor to take complete bed rest, but was not given any other medication. His condition persisted, but the degree varied from day to day. At the end of the cruise, Victor went home to Iloilo and there had himself examined. The examination revealed that he had tuberculosis. Victor sued for medical reimbursement, damages, and attorney's fees, claiming that tuberculosis was a compensable illness. Do you agree with Victor? TB is listed under Section 32A of the POEA SEC as a work-related disease. It was also either contracted or aggravated during the effectivity of Victor's contract. Having shown its manifestation on board, Victor should have been medically repatriated for further examination and treatment in the Philippines. This obligation was entirely omitted in bad faith by the company when it waited for his contract to expire on him before signing him off. On this basis, Victor is entitled to medical reimbursement, damages, and attorney's fees. Due to his prolonged illness, Victor was unable to work for more than 120 days. Will this entitle him to claim total permanent disability? No. Victor's TB is work-related and it developed on board, thereby satisfying the twin requisites of compensability. However, despite his knowledge of his medical condition, he failed to report to his manning agent within three days from his arrival, as required by Section 20, Letter B, Number 3 of the POESEC. Since he already felt the manifestation of TB before his sign-off, he should have submitted to post-employment medical examination, Jebsen's Maritime, versus Enrique Undag. The effect of his coastal safe marine services 
versus Elmer T. Esguera. Omission is forfeiture by him of disability benefits. In effect, the 120-day rule has no application at all. Labor Relations Solar Plexus Bar and Nightclub Allowed by Tolerance 50 Guest Relations Officers, GRO to work without compensation in its establishment under the direct supervision of its manager from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. every day, including Sundays and holidays. The GROs, however, are free to ply their trade elsewhere at any time, but once they enter the premises of the nightclub, they are required to stay up to closing time. The GROs earn their keep exclusively from commissions for food and drinks and tips from generous customers. In time, the GROs form the Solar Ugnayan ng mga kababaihan inaapi, Suki, a labor union duly registered with Do. Subsequently, Suki filed a petition for certification election in order to be recognized as the exclusive bargaining agent of its members. Solar Plexus opposed the petition for a certification election on the singular ground of a sense of employer-employee relationship between the GROs on one hand, in the nightclub on the other hand. May the GROs form Suki as a labor organization for purposes of collective bargaining? The GROs may form Suki as a labor organization for purposes of collective bargaining. There is an employer employee relationship between the GRO and the nightclub. The labor code in Article 138 provides that any woman who is permitted or suffered to work with or without compensation in any nightclub, cocktail lounge, Massage clinic, bar, or similar establishment under the effective control or supervision of the employer for a substantial period of time, as determined by the Secretary of Labor, shall be considered as an employee of such establishment for purposes of labor and social legislation. In the case at bar, it is clearly stated that the women, once they enter the premises of the nightclub, would be under the direct supervision of the manager from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., every day, including Sundays and holidays, such as indicative of an employer-employee relationship since the manager would be exercising the right of control. How does the government employee's right to self-organization differ from that of the employees in the private sector? There is no substantial difference of the right of self-organization between workers in the private sector and those in the public sector. In the public sector, Executive Order No. 180, the purpose of self-organization is stated, as for the furtherance and protection of their interests. In the private sector, Article 243 of the Labor Code states, for the purpose of collective bargaining and for the purpose of enhancing and defending their interests and for their mutual aid and protection. Furthermore, no less than the Constitution itself guarantees that all workers have the right to self-organization. Do workers have a right not to join a labor organization? Yes. The constitutional right to self-organization has two aspects, the right to join or form labor organizations and the right not to join said organization, Victoriano versus Elizalde. Moreover, if they are members of a religious group whose doctrine forbids union membership, their right not to be compelled to become union members has been upheld. However, if the worker is not a religious objector and there is a union security clause, he may be required to join the union if he belongs to the bargaining unit, Reyes versus Trajano. Do the following workers have the right to self-organization, reason, and basis? A. Employed of non-stock non-profit organization, alien employees, 2000. A. Even employees of non-stock, non-profit organizations have the right to self-organization. This is explicitly provided for in Article 243 of the Labor Code. A possible exception, however, are employee members of non-stock, non-profit cooperatives. B. Alien employees with valid work permits may exercise the right to self-organization on the basis of parity or reciprocity. That is, if Filipino workers in the aliens country are given the same right. Article 269, Labor Code. Mangbali, owner of a shoe repair shop with only nine workers in his establishment, received proposals for collective bargaining from the Bali Shoe Union. Mangbali refused to bargain with the workers for several reasons. First, 
His shoe business is just a service establishment. Second, his workers are paid on a piecework basis, like per shoe repair, and not on a time basis. Third, he has less than 10 employees in the establishment, which reason or reasons is are tenable. None. First, Mangbali's shoe business is a commercial enterprise, albeit a service establishment. Second, the mere fact that the workers are paid on a piece rate basis does not negate their status as regular employees. Payment by piece is just a method of compensation and does not define the essence of the relation, Lumbo versus NLRC. Third, the employee's right to self-organization is not delimited by their number. The right to self-organization covers all persons employed in commercial, industrial, and agricultural enterprises and in religious, charitable, medical, or educational institutions, whether operating for profit or not. Article 243, Labor Code PhilHealth is a government-owned and controlled corporation employing thousands of Filipinos. Because of the desire of the employees of PhilHealth to obtain better terms and conditions of employment from the government, they formed the PhilHealth Employees Association, P.A., and demanded PhilHealth to enter into negotiations with PA regarding terms and conditions of employment which are not fixed by law. Are the employees of PhilHealth allowed to self-organize and form PA and thereafter demand PhilHealth to enter into negotiations with PA for better terms and conditions of employment? 2014. Yes, employees of PhilHealth are allowed to self-organize under Section 8, Article 3 and Section 3, Article 13 of the Constitution, which recognize the rights of all workers to self-organization. They cannot demand, however, for better terms and conditions of employment for the same are fixed by law, 244 Labor Code. Besides, their salaries are standardized by Congress, Article 276 Labor Code. Bargaining Representative The Ang Sarap Kainan Workers Union appointed Juan Javier, a law student, as bargaining representative. Mr. Javier is neither an employee of Ang Sarap Kainan Company nor a member of the union. Is the appointment of Mr. Javier a bargaining representative in accord with law? Yes, the law does not require that the bargaining representative be an employee of the company nor an officer or a member of the union. Article 212 Determination of Representation Status 2016 The most of determining an exclusive bargaining agreement are A. Voluntary recognition. B. Certification election. C. Consent election. I explain briefly how they differ from one another. There is voluntary recognition when in an unorganized establishment with only one legitimate labor organization, the employer voluntarily recognizes the representation status of such a union. Within 30 days from such recognition, the employer and union shall submit a notice of voluntary recognition with the Regional Office of the Department of Labor and Employment, which issued the recognized labor union certificate of registration or certificate of creation of a chartered local. B. Certification election refers to the process of determining through secret ballot the sole and exclusive representative of the employees in an appropriate bargaining unit for purposes of collective bargaining or negotiation. A certification election is ordered by the Department of Labor and Employment, while a consent election is voluntarily agreed upon by the parties with or without the intervention by the department. C. When the process of determining through secret ballot the sole and exclusive representative of the employees in an appropriate bargaining unit is not ordered by the Department of Labor and Employment, but has been voluntarily agreed upon by the parties with or without the intervention of the Department of Labor and Employment, then the process is a consent election. There are instances when a certification election is mandatory. What is the rationale for such a legal mandate? According to the Labor Code, in any establishment where there is no certified bargaining agent, a certification election shall automatically be conducted by the mid arbiter upon the filing of a petition by the legitimate labor organization. In the above described situation, a certification election is made mandatory because if there is no certified bargaining agent as determined 
by a certification election, there could be no collective bargaining in the said unorganized establishment. The YY Glass had 600 rank and file employees. Three rival unions, A, B, and C, participated in the certification elections ordered by the mid arbiter. 500 employees voted. The unions obtained the following votes A, 200, B, 150, C, 50. 90 employees voted no union, and 10 were segregated votes. Out of the segregated votes, four were cast by probationary employees and six were cast by dismissed employees whose perspective cases are still on appeal, 2014. Should the votes of the probationary and dismissed employees be counted in the total votes cast for the purpose of determining the winning labor union? Yes. Rule 11, Section 5 of Dole Department Order 4003 provides that a. Employees who are members of the appropriate bargaining unit sought to be represented by the petitioner at the time of the issuance of the order granting the conduct of a certification election shall be eligible to vote. An employee who has been dismissed from work but has contested the legality of the dismissal in a form of appropriate jurisdiction at the time of the issuance of the order for the conduct of a certification election shall be considered a qualified voter unless his or her dismissal was declared valid in a final judgment at the time of the conduct of the certification election. Was there a valid election? Yes. To have a valid election, at least a majority of all eligible voters in the unit must have cast their votes. Article 256, now Article 266 of the Labor Code. In the instant case, 500 out of 600 rank and file employees voted. Should Union A be declared a winner? No. The Labor Code provides that the Labor Union receiving the majority of the valid votes cast shall be certified as the exclusive bargaining agent of all the workers in the unit. Article 256. Now Article 266. Here the number of valid votes cast is 490. Thus, the winning union should receive at least 246 votes. Union A only receives 200 votes. Suppose the election is declared invalid, which of the contending unions should represent the rank and file employees? None of them should represent the rank and file employees. Suppose that in the election, the unions obtain the following votes. A. 250. B. 150. C. 50. 40 voted no union and 10 were segregated votes. Should Union A be certified as the bargaining representative? Yes. The Labor Code provides that the labor union receiving the majority of the valid votes cast shall be certified as an exclusive bargaining agent of all the workers in the unit, Article 256, or 266 now. Here, the number of valid votes cast is, is 490. Thus, the winning union should receive at least 246 votes. Union A received 250 votes. Samahang East Gate Enterprises, or SEGE, is a labor organization composed of the rank and file employees of East Gate Enterprises, EGE, the leading manufacturer of all types of gloves and aprons. Ege was later requested by Sege to bargain collectively for better terms and conditions of employment of all the rank and file employees of Ege. Consequently, Ege filed a petition for certification election before the Bureau of Labor Relations. During the proceedings, Ege insisted that it should participate in the certification process. Ege reasoned that since it was the one who filed the petition, and considering that the employees concerned were its own rank and file employees, it should be allowed to take an active part in the certification process. Is the contention of EGE proper? 14. No. Under Article 258-A of the Labor Code, an employer is a mere bystander in certification elections. Whether the petition for certification election is filed by said employer or a legitimate labor organization, the employer shall not be considered a party thereto, with a concomitant right to oppose a petition for a certification election. Among the 400 regular rank and file workers of MNO Company, a certification election was ordered conducted by the mid arbiter of the region. The contending parties obtained the following votes Union A 70, B 71, C 42, No Union 180, Spoiled Votes 4. There were no objections or challenges raised by any party on the results of their election. Can Union B be certified as the sole and exclusive collective bargaining agent among the rank and file? 
workers of MNO company considering that it garnered the highest number of votes among the contending unions? Why or why not? No. To be certified as bargaining agent, the vote required is majority of the valid votes cast. There were 396 valid votes cast, the majority of which is 199. Since Union B got only 71 votes, it cannot be certified as the sole and exclusive bargaining agent of MNO's rank and file workers. May the management or lawyers of MNO company legally ask for the absolute termination of the certification election proceedings because 180 of the workers, a clear plurality of the voters, have chosen not to be represented by any union reasons? No. Because 216 workers want to be represented by a union as bargaining agent, only 180 workers opted for no union. Hence, a clear majority is in favor of being represented by a union. If you were the duly designated election officer in this case, what would you do to effectively achieve the purpose of certification election proceedings? Discuss. I will conduct a runoff election between the labor unions receiving the two highest number of votes. To have a runoff election, all the contending unions, three or more choices required, must have garnered 50% of the number of votes cast. In the present case, there are four contending unions and they have garnered 216 votes. There were 400 vote cast. The votes garnered by the contending unions is even more than 50% of the number of votes cast. Hence, a runoff election is in order. Q. The Construction and Development Corporation has a total of 1,100 employees. In a certification election ordered by the Bureau of Labor Relations to elect the bargaining representative of the employees, it was determined that only 1,000 employees are eligible voters. In the election, a total of 900 ballots was cast. There were 15 spoiled ballots and 5 blank ballots. A total of 400 votes was cast for ABC Labor Union. A total of 240 votes was cast in favor of JVP labor union and a total of 240 votes was in favor of RLG labor organization. Is there a valid certification election? There is a valid certification election. In the facts of the case in question, there is no bar to the holding of the certification election. The labor code provides in Article 256 that to have a valid certification election, at least a majority of all eligible voters in the bargaining unit must have cast their votes in the election. In the facts of the case in question, 1,000 employees are eligible voters and 900 voters, which is very much more than the majority of 501 of the eligible voters cast their votes. Rights of Labor Organization The union deducted 20 passes from Rogelius wages for January Upon inquiry, he learned that it was for death, eight benefits, and that the deduction was made pursuant to a board resolution of the directors of the union. Can Rogelio object the deduction? 2002. Yes. In order that the special assessment death eight benefit may be upheld as valid, the following requisites must be complied with. An authorization by a written resolution of the majority of all members at a general membership meeting duly called for the purpose. 2. Secretary's record of the meeting. and 3. Individual written authorization for the check of duly signed by the employee concerned. ABS-CBN Supervisors, Employees versus ABS-CBN Broadcast Corporation and Union Officers. In the problem given, none of the above requisites were complied with by the union. Hence, Rogelio can object to the deduction made by the union for being invalid. Note. Substantial compliance of the requirement is not enough in view of the fact that the special assessment will diminish the compensation of union members. Palacol v. Ferrer Caleja. Attorney Facundo Veloso was retained by Welga Labor Union to represent it in the collective bargaining negotiations. It was agreed that Attorney Veloso would be paid in the sum of 20000 as attorney's fees for his assistance in the CBN negotiations. After the conclusion of the negotiations, Welga Labor Union collected from its individual members the sum of 100 each to pay for Attorney Veloso's fees and another sum of 100 each for services rendered by the union officers. 
several members of the Welga Labor Union approached you to seek advice on the following matters. Whether or not the collection of the amount assessed on the individual members to answer for the attorney's fees was valid. The assessment for attorney's fees is not valid. The Labor Code prohibits the payment of attorney's fees when it is affected through forced contributions from the workers from their own funds as distinguished from the union funds. Article 222 Letter B Labor Code The obligation to pay the attorney's fees belong to the union and cannot be shunted to the workers as their direct responsibility. Bank of the Philippine Islands Employees Union versus NLRC Whether or not the assessment of 100 from the individual members of the Welga Labor Union for services rendered by the union officers in the CBA negotiation was valid. The assessment for negotiation fees is not valid. The Labor Code prohibits negotiation fees and other similar charges of any kind arising from any collective bargaining negotiations to be imposed on any individual member of the contracting union. Article 222, Letter B, Labor Code. Note, special assessments may be allowed like attorney's fees and negotiation fees, provided that there be strict compliance with the requisites of a valid special assessment. Article 241, Letter N and O of the Labor Code. What requisites must a union comply with before it can validly impose special assessments against its members for incidental expenses, attorney's fees, representation expenses, and the like? 2002-2001. In order that the special assessment may be upheld as valid, the following requisites must be complied with. 1. Authorization by a written resolution of the majority of all the members at the general membership meeting duly called for the purpose. 2. Secretary's record of the meeting. and 3. Individual written authorization for the checkoff duly signed by the employee concerned. ABS-CBN Supervisors Employees Union Members versus ABS-CBN Broadcasting Corporation Collective Bargaining ABC Company and U Labor Union have been negotiating for a new collective bargaining agreement, CBA, but failed to agree on certain economic provisions of the existing agreement. In the meantime, the existing CBA expired. The company thereafter refused to pay the employees their mid-year bonus, saying that the CBA, which provided for the grant of mid-year bonus to all company employees, had already expired. Are the employees entitled to be paid their mid-year bonus? 2010. Yes. Under Article 253 of the Labor Code, the parties are duty-bound to maintain the status quo and to continue in full force and effect the terms and conditions of the existing CBA until a new agreement is reached by the parties. Likewise, Article 253-A provides for an automatic renewal clause of a CBA. Although a CBA has expired, it continues to have legal effects as between the parties until a new CBA has been entered into. The same is also supported by the principle of holdover, which states that despite the lapse of the formal effectivity of the CBA, the law still considers the same as continuing in force and effect until a new CBA shall have been validly executed. Merelco v. Honorable Secretary of Labor, 337-90. The terms and conditions of the existing CBA remain under the principle of CBA continuity. What Dictional preconditions must be present to set in motion the mechanics of a collective bargaining. To set in motion the mechanics of collective bargaining, these jurisdictional preconditions must be present. Namely, 1. The employees in a bargaining unit should form a labor organization. The labor organization should be a legitimate labor organization. 3. As such legitimate labor organization, it should be recognized or certified as the collective bargaining representative of the employees of the bargaining unit and for the labor organization as the collective bargaining representative should request the employer to bargain collectively. Articles 243, 234, 255, and 250 of the Labor Code. What is an appropriate bargaining unit for purposes of collective bargaining? An appropriate bargaining unit is a group of employees of a given employer comprised of all or less than all of the entire body of employees, which the collective interest of all the employees consistent with the interests of the employer indicated to be the best suited to serve reciprocal rights and duties of the parties under the collective bargaining provisions of the law. 
University of the Philippines v. Ferrer Caleja. CBA Mandatory Provisions of CBA Jensen & Jensen JJ is a domestic corporation engaged in the manufacturing of consumer products. Its rank and file workers organized the Jensen Employees Union, JEU, a duly registered and local union affiliated with PALFLU, a national union, after having been certified as the exclusive bargaining agent of the appropriate bargaining unit, JAU PAFLU submitted his proposal for a collective bargaining agreement with the company. In the meantime, a power struggle occurred within the national union PAFLU between its national president, Manny Pacquiao, and its national secretary general, Gabriel Miro. The representation issue within PAFLU is pending resolution before the Office of the Secretary of Labor. By reason for this in Tri union dispute within PAFLU, JNJ obstinately and consistently refused to offer any counter proposal and to bargain collectively with PAFLU JEU until the representation issue within PAFLU shall have been resolved with finality. JEU PAFLU filed a notice of strike. The Secretary of Labor subsequently assumed jurisdiction over the labor dispute. With the representation issue that has arisen, involving the National Union PAFLU to which the duly registered local union JEU is affiliated by collective bargaining negotiation with JNJ. The representation issue that has arisen involving the National Union PAFLU should not bar collective bargaining negotiation with JNJ. It is the local union JEU that has the right to bargain with the employer JNJ and not the National Union PAFLU. It is immaterial whether the representation issue within PAFLU has been resolved with finality or not. Said squabble could not possibly serve as a bar to any collective bargaining since PAFLU is not the real party in interest to the talks. Rather, the negotiations are confined to the corporation and the local union JEU. Only the collective bargaining agent, the local union JEU, possesses the legal standing to negotiate with the corporation, a duly registered local union affiliated with the national union or federation does not lose its legal personality or independence. Adamson and Adamson Inc. versus the Courts of Industrial Relations in Adamson and Adamson Supervising Union, FFW. Can a secretary of labor decide the labor dispute by awarding the JEU CBA proposal as the collective bargaining agreement of the parties? Yes, the Secretary of Labor can decide the labor dispute by awarding the JEU CBA proposal as the collective bargaining agreement between the parties because when the Secretary of Labor, under Article 263, assumes jurisdiction over a labor dispute, causing or likely to cause a strike or lockout in an industry indispensable to the national interest, the Secretary of Labor exercises the power of compulsory arbitration over the labor dispute, meaning that as an exception to the general rule, the Secretary of Labor now has the power to set or fix wages, rates or of pay, hours of work, or terms and conditions of employment by determining what should be the CBA of the parties. Divine Word University versus Secretary of Labor Alternative answer. What is involved in the case is a corporation engaged in the manufacturing of consumer products. If the consumer products that are being manufactured are not such that a strike against the company cannot be considered a strike in an industry indispensable for the national interest, then the assumption of jurisdiction by the Secretary of Labor is not proper. Therefore, he cannot legally exercise the power of compulsory arbitration in the labor dispute.